Okay, go ahead. titled Creating for a Better Industry and um, so I started for myself I started making interactive art on a computer what would now fall under the umbrella term of video game over 20 years ago the internet was a different place then I can't count the amount of times that I was told by teachers or other professional adults that the internet was a niche that will die basically that I'm wasting my creativity Despite how misunderstood the internet was, there was this immense possibility space for us artists to shape what it meant to create there. Anything was possible. It could become anything. Schools were not teaching the type of art that I was interested in. This was net art, websites, and all the fascinating ways that art was being explored in the digital context. Then I believed that the internet and as a result websites were the future of art. So I'm going to show some of my work. Um, yeah, so uh, my main project, where's the internet? How does Safari Firefox to the left. Firefox to the left. Done in the box. Done. Oh, there it is. Okay, there, here's the internet. My first project, or one of my first was, second, was tetrageddon.com, and uh, it's loading. So this was an uh, online arcade of Flash websites originally that were kind of like a big, kind of uh, parodying what video games are, just like crazy loud nonsense with lots of memes and lots of colors. And uh, over the years I, was, I kept rebuilding it because, you know, Flash died. So this is the latest uh, rendition of it for online, which is like this, um, you find this website. It's... Everything you click on does something. Please accept these cookies. They're good cookies. Okay, I accept. You can scream into the void. If you scream often enough, uh, you get a you get a, um, an award basically it says congratulations you screamed in the void this often, many times these are good screams and you can save the animated gif but I won't do that now so um, there, lots of tangents already the EULA is like a summoning ritual for a ghost it gives you all the instructions for summoning the summoning a ghost and the entity you are giving your freedoms away to So yeah, and uh, it, to get to the games, then you click on the monkey. And uh, Cyber Monkey has died. So it's this um, a big tan, lots of rabbit holes here. And essentially, to get to the games, you have to find the ghost, and uh, you get a password for them from them by pleasing giving an offering to the bone lord i'll do that really quickly by burning bones here that you can make turn into a sculpture it's kind of in line with when web websites were really about exploring different tangents and links and networks and one thing led to the other and it was kind of like the journey is a reward in itself and uh, it's kind of the, um, I have other game, desktop games that are similar in that they explore, it's more about the Easter eggs that uh, atta are attached to each other and uh, rewarding a player with finding strange things rather than a very straightforward beginning, to, uh, beginning middle, and end kind of story. So like here, to get the password, you have to make a bone, bone sculpture for it. The password is sorry. And then uh, the games are like locked on, 
locked on itch and to access the itch page you would put in the password. So yeah, that gives you an idea of one of the websites. And then another one is, uh, I went on to exploring this kind of, uh, in terms of a tool, it's called the Electric Zine Maker, it's a throwback to, okay. It's a, this is a throwback to um, the glory days of desktop publishing, kind of like uh, when, on, uh, when software was silly, loud, crazy. If you think in terms of like games like Mario Paint or Microsoft Kids, uh, you, you know, software was just really kind of a weird space that you could uh, explore rather than create, and then you weren't sure where the tool or the uh, uh, game began or ended, so it was more like a toy. And it's not really playing, but okay. Let's see if I can show a little bit of it. Sorry, it's a bit clumsy because I had a, there was a little computer situation, but um, no. So imagine this is a really wild, colorful tool where you create zines and then the drawing interfaces like uh, lots of joke little tools like a bacon brush or eggs that you can splat on your art and uh, you know like it's very much about exploring how you can create something in this really surreal digital context and it became quite popular because it's such a weird, abstract, silly, loud and strange tool that's very meditative to use because it, you can just basically press buttons and something cool is going to happen for you. So that and uh, it all my work kind of uh, the games will uh, fit into the fictional context, context of an online space that I created for them like in this case I'm not sure how well I could, can show it to you. I made a website for about a fictional technology that Macromedia Fish, and um, that the, this is supposedly built in. And uh, if you go to the website, then you have it tasks you with um, searching for this lost technology called the fish, and uh, it gets really weird. Like you just fall into this rabbit hole and uh, of um, broken directories, broken images. Uh, online traps and you know like you want to escape the site it's going to be a uh, locked a, lo a locked uh, hidden directory and you have to find the password by uh, helping the fish out find his friend in the old uh, uh, game demos uh, you know the, the his friend is trapped in his old game demos and yeah so it's it's a really long tangent. At the end, you find a, find the software, and it's barely working. And you free the fish, and it's a, this cute desktop pet that you can then have on your desktop forever because whatever's left of the technology is this cute little creature. So it's kind of like there's uh, Easter eggs in desktop games that lead into this fictional online websites that uh, have their own narrative and their own world. And by doing that, you kind of create this whole branching structure of secret stories and hidden places that your work exists and people love that because it's all about exploring it's not so much about uh, being given a goal in a game and you go follow that in a very restrictive sense so that that's kind of like where my work is coming out of so a lot has changed since the time that I started the internet is not a niche that you have to explain to most people Computers, technology, and the power structure of who gets to participate and who is left behind is a constant push and pull between individuals and the giant corporations that turned this into an industry that's monetized. In many ways, I think that digital art is at a very interesting and critical impasse, largely because of how the culture of the tech industry has shifted to become more of a mon monolithic extension of late capitalism. And as a result of the tremendous amounts of money to be made, the way that emerging technologies like AI are being presented. The type of creative freedom that I am used to is going to very much vary from the type of creative freedom a newcomer is used to. As such, I think it's important to maintain an understanding of what type of personal power we each as individuals have. It's important to realize the responsibility we have always had when it comes to participating and shaping the digital art or tech landscape. 
creating and self-distributing software, games, and websites is still a concept that exists. As creators here, it is, a, it is something we need to fight for in the way we choose to participate. The way we participate is what gives things power. I should point out that every mainstream established tool that you use to make your games like Unity or even Adobe products began as an underdog. Unity more so was viewed as an alternative to Flash games. At the beginning, Unity was a tool that had a heavy amount of creative vision, drive, and inspiring philosophy behind it. It promised to be something empowering to everyone. It was an indie darling. As it grew, it kicked to the curb the very people who made it what it is. This is an inescapable reality when industry, investors, and money are involved. But it's important to remember that these things became what they are not because of investors or CEOs, but because of everyone, the little people, the hobbyists, that made it what it is. Our participation is our greatest strength here. The unique voice we bring to the table and the way we make and express ourselves as artists is what gives our work power. So, um, where? Wait. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this yeah. one, right? Yeah. yeah. There you go. Uh, I'm just talking about there. So here's some good reading on that. The uh, Wikipedia article from the uh, old Google model used to be don't be evil, uh, ironically enough. And I think it's a very interesting thing to kind of history to follow in terms of how uh, something that used to be good and used to have a, a strong vision for a philosophy for a positive internet kind of turns into this very uh, terrifying monopoly and then you have websites like HTML for the people which is a guide for creating your own website absolutely from scratch and it's uh, made for people that ha don't have any technical knowledge you have um, zines on itch that also explain how to make a website for those that don't have any technical knowledge or how to host your own website so th this gives you a good overview of uh, how this stuff is very much within reach for anyone if you know where to look when I started, it was common knowledge that you could create and host your own website. Anyone could make the next Facebook or Google. Participating in tech was in anyone's hands. Even Google at one point had a motto of don't be evil. I think it has since abandoned that type of tech culture, but even so, these things grow, exist, and thrive because of what they promise to people like us. When I started, anyone could make a Flash game, distribute it to run in the browser, and make a living from that work. Browser games were everywhere. As our online spaces began to, chase, began to change with the emergence of social media, the way our online behavior was funneled into a handful of centralized websites owned by companies, the way our online social spaces became controlled by individual corporations rather than small people hosting their own communities, and the way our understanding of owning a computer has changed to be that of apps and the walled garden of the app store, it's really important to point out that our interaction with tech may have changed to be extremely controlled and seem like we have a dependency on corporations, but the original underlying structure still exists. We have power to exist independently and create our own alternatives too. At the core of it, we can participate our own way if we know where to look. You can still create websites, your own tools, distribute your own software, and how to do that is very important to understanding to cultivate. Tech literacy is an imperative, especially in the era that we are right in right now. I'll make my point when it comes to AI. AI has existed since ever. It's not new. You have video game AI, dialogue AI, grammar and spell checker AI, social media algorithms could be described as that. It's not hard to find examples of how this is everywhere. Come this new phenomena of large learning models and AI generators, now it becomes a buzzword because tech today is structured to need the, very, the next big thing for its hype cycles. With these hype cycles comes a general mentality that we, as participants, need these large entities in order to enjoy these new things. We can only participate as consumers, not creators of a tech. AI is the current buzzword, is something heavily hyped and mystified that promises everything. It promises to be the singularity you hear about in science fiction, to true artificial sentient intelligence, to something that will replace all artists. That type of hype surrounding it is possible because of a sense of ignorance and helplessness cultivated in the average internet user. Often conversations surrounding it can sound very much like fear-mongering if you know enough about the technology. 
I have to think that ultimately, even this extreme black and white, unnuanced criticism of AI serves the bottom line of corporations more than it does artists or creators criticizing a technology. AI models are freely available, and if you so choose, you could install one on your own computer and have your own running that you train on your own work or even start building yourself. There are plenty of open source solutions that put that power in your own hands. When I say this, I mean completely bypass any services and really do it yourself. Doing this removes the mysticism of buzzwords. You see that a lot of the promise of true artificial intelligence, sentience and AI and all this hype is really just buzzword hype. You quickly realize that they take a lot of time and effort to really produce anything worthwhile. Anyone choosing to work with open source models would see that AI chat personalities are absolutely not self-aware sentient beings. This is the type of rhetoric that seems common if you read forums surrounding character AI communities where kids panic if they lose a character and constantly ask if this is a real person. Or on the other end of the spectrum, you see the promise of replacing all artists ever and generally how companies describe these things. But these are really just complex systems that are just as flawed. The tech industry is structured to prefer hype over reality. I think it's important to point out that this type of ignorance driven by buzzwords is harmful to everyone. It disempowers us. It also creates a mentality that the only people equipped to build on and form the future of technologies like this are large tech entities. Um, and then this slide, there's uh, interesting reading. I, I recommend the Possibility Space uh, blog because this is someone that worked with AI and feels a bit disenfranchised because AI has become this whole other monster. and. He's trying to spread some awareness about how uh, these systems actually work and the reality behind them. So as a tangent, that's uh, possibilityspace.org is a really good blog to check out. The fact that people think it is something greater than both their cap capabilities to understand or even do themselves like exploring open source solutions is what surrenders a lot of our own power to corporations who are abusing tech or driving it in a direction that alienates everyone else. Our critical participation is important in this age where we are being walled off as creators and distributors of software, games, and digital art. Tech literacy is vital for our future. If we do not conscientiously participate in these things or even criticize these things with understanding of how they really work, the only people left to drive the future of these technologies are corporations building a future that disempowers us and does not favor everyone. All this is true for game development too. Game development is an extension of the tech space. It is not immune to these issues either. It is important to have a strong understanding of alternatives when participating here. If we do this, we create a space where independence, DIY culture, and creative freedom continues to thrive with our conscious participation. For example, a while ago I posted a small thread on social media about how solo development is a wonderful, empowering thing. As you can imagine, it garnered some criticism because that's what happens on social media. But the most interesting negative sentiment towards solo development was quite a few people really believing that you can't make games on your own. Their point was that you need a team, budget, and the resources of many people to do that. This is the type of dispowerment that I'm talking about. It's fueled by ignorance about DIY tech culture. I make all my games completely on my own. I have no outside help in development or distribution. I learned to code, write, make sound and music, art, all on my own. I learned how to produce, market, and sell on my own. You can do that. Knowledge of how to do it is completely accessible. This type of creative independence and self-sufficiency is something that's always been part of the computer culture. I am completely self-taught. I do not have a team or anyone making games with me. I make everything on my own. My work has won enough awards, recognition, and made it into enough exhibits to go to show that it is compar of comparable quality. I can't count the number of times that my work went up against work made by larger teams in mainstream festivals, and it actually won. You don't need anything but your own determination and willingness to always learn. That's it. That's at the heart of computer culture. The space is for individualistic expression, too. That said, this type of ignorance in my examples where people believe it's just not possible without a larger corporate entity, teams, or many resources is something I think generally disempowers us in our digital world. DIY culture exists in all factors of tech, from distribution to AI to building things. 
So if we really educate ourselves and keep fostering our own independence, we create a posi positive future where tech games creation here stays for everyone. So all that said, for every mainstream tool, there exists a dozen alternatives that do just as much as the mainstream tool. I often hear criticism that these alternatives are not as good, but if you really go use this and create a development ecosystem where you understand these tools and use them in an informed manner, you get more from them than you would from any commercial closed system. I try to keep up with what gets posted on, my it, on itch in my cool tools collection. This started when I began developing the Electric Zine Maker. I wanted to get a better understanding of other interesting, unique, colorful, or personable tools made by others out there. I went into this unaware of how much existed. The diversity of tools, weird niche use cases, and interesting things that each solves is incredible. Once you know about the space, you see it everywhere. There are countless game engine alternatives too. Initiatives like engines Game Engine's database exists to make finding them as accessible as possible. Game Engine's database is a large, growing database of game engines that sorts content so you can find alternatives based on popular keywords like 2D, agnostic, scripting languages, or making games for the web or desktop. The Tiny Tools directory does the same, but specifically for any open source experimental or tiny tool. You can find programs there for painting, writing, coding, making fonts, Websites like these are wonderful examples of how that space is endless. It's always growing. It's impossible to catalog all of it. When you look at a tool like Bitsy, Pico8, or any of these tiny engines, it's easy to underestimate their importance or brush them off as small hobbyist things. These tools teach us the basics of creating something within the constraints of a system, as well as giving us space to grow from that. Small tools like these help us explore our, our ideas. For example, Celeste was first built in Pico 8. You see how you can prototype and grow from these tools. Every tool has a place here and has something to offer. It's an exciting part of the creative journey to invest in new ways to use all these. I regularly use these smaller tools to s structure my ideas. I also use them with my bigger projects as little tangents or hidden Easter eggs. For example, you can see some screenshots in this picture. A lot of writing that you can discover in Blue Suburbia, which is my current project built in Unreal, are Bitsy pocket platformer, pocket platformer or Decker games bundled with the Unreal game. So while exploring a visually high quality 3D space, you find these smaller fragments made in these lo-fi tools where you explore writing. It makes the project much more compelling. Godot has grown in stride since it's become a very powerful alternative to Unity. You can do anything in it, and I think it's a beautiful example of where games and software development intersect because it has a lot of capabilities to go beyond making games in it. People make game engines using Godot. For example, see RPG in a box. The flexibility here empowers you to make some very unique things. As you start participating in the independent tool space, you find becoming yourself becoming kind of a collector of unusual tools and you start invest, inventing uses for them. Like I'll find these silly tools for making animated GIFs. I end up using the, these in my larger projects. After a while, it's like you have these little secret techniques for making visually interesting games. It's a very different mindset for making games. It's not just about getting good at that one big development environment like Unity or Unreal. It's about inventing ways to use tools in an interesting and expressive way. This doesn't just extend to games. There are countless web communities around building and hosting your own websites like NecoWeb, NeoCities, or MMM.page, which is this amazing initiative that empowers anyone to create unique personal websites. Most of these help you host it too, so you can be part of a community. It's a very personal way to exist online, much like how the old internet was. If you're aware of all these interesting things, you can extend what your game is. Your game doesn't just need to exist in its own little bundled EXE or installer. The fiction you create can exist on websites that lead to your game that has all sorts of other interesting extras surrounding it. You can take up digital space in a really compelling, creative way. Uh, there's a video here, so I can... Uh, yes, I can do that. Um, six? No. Uh, 
Wait, they're on the desktop, right? Yeah, but I just put <laughs> I just put the slides on, not the whole folder. Yes, there. Okay. There's a video on here. Six. That. Six. Yeah, oh yeah. That's cool. the one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So this is the website I just showed, but. So, for example, I wanted the Electric Z Maker to exist in a fictional universe, so it's kind of like a fantasy tool. I made this ARG-like website for a fictional technology it was supposedly built in called macromediafish.com. If you go exploring that, you find this really cute little tangent and story about the fictional technology. Other tools and work are side in this online game, like the Electric File Monitor, which is a fictional virus scanner that turns your computer into a prison industrial complex by accusing various files on your computer of being viruses. So you have to sort through that, and you cre it has its own monetary system and everything that you end up playing with based on all the files that are on your computer. So it's a small illustration of how your work can exist in many contexts. You, just, you take up space in this really beautiful, compelling way with your games. When it comes to alternatives, if you think of something you need or want or miss, there is likely a tool, platform, or space out there, usually open source, that serves as a wonderful solution. They don't get the attention they deserve. Our creative participation here is what will set the tone for the future. The longer you are here, the more you realize how important it is to be as self-sufficient as possible when creating digital art like games. Um, yeah. So here's some other reading that I think is really fascinating, especially Vanishing Culture, which is about uh, the ephemeral nature of our digital realm and how that push and pull between preservation and uh, corporate interest and all that and uh, also blue sky and shittification is a really good link because it also illustrates how these platforms start with the benevolent direction and all that but the fact that there is a investor culture and CMSs and uh, sorry not CMSs, investors um, that entire structure is what causes institutification. So it, it, we're in this cycle of losing online history and losing work because of, of that. So it's, these illustrate why these alternatives and DIY culture is necessary for the future of tech. When I started, Flash was the technology to use. The tool chain was incredible. Macromedia listened to its user base and so many people influenced the direction the technology took that it became this beautiful, flexible thing you could use for anything. It seemed like Flash would live forever. It was truly everywhere at one time. Adobe bought Macromedia and as a result of many bad decisions over the years, Flash is now gone. Unity became the replacement for Flash. Unity was the tool for, to use for indie developers. It was the indie darling. The people that initially worked there really created a beautiful tool that, driven by beautiful philosophies. Based on a number of bad decisions, especially recent controversies with Unity, its future, future looks just as bleak as Flash's did. We keep losing our darlings to the same system. Understanding a larger tool chain and getting good at many tools, especially open source ones, gives us a way out from this pattern. Good game design is engine agnostic. What you cultivate in one tool set, engine, or creative environment easily translates to another. It's not wasted knowledge. Good game design and development practices are not dependent on the tools. They are an interactive language and way of expressing yourself that you, as the creator, explore, hone, and perfect over a long time. This is a creative journey where you, you develop your own design language and development methodologies for yourself. Exploring many tools helps you on that journey, and it helps you claim a type of independence from bad decision-making on part of the companies that you rely on for, for your tools. It's always, been said to, to see when, it's always been sad to see when creators that rely so much on a tool like Unity or Flash or web art say that a certain decision from the driving forces behind a platform or technology completely destroyed their will to keep creating. I've seen it often. It's incredibly disheartening. We don't need to keep falling victim to that. Breaking out of that cycle starts with participating in alternatives. And thank you. That's my talk. <laughs> thank you. Anybody have questions for that one? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I wanted to know how um, if, you, uh, if you uh, because I played the, everything is going to be OK. I was wondering uh, how you got the videos background, did you film them all, or, or are there like uh, some videos from the internet? 
Yeah, uh, there's some interesting thought processes that went into that. So, like, the Internet Archive has a Prelanger Archive and Ephemeral Archive. I might be butchering those words, but it has these uh, old abandoned footages, uh, advertisements, often some really weird, bizarre things like old toy products that never worked out. So. I would uh, go through it and collect the broken parts of that footage, static that looks like it could be maybe repurposed to look like a landscape or whatever, and run it through some uh, glitch uh, filters that I made. You know, or, like there's a lot of ways online that we, that you can generate glitch art, and and uh, it was it's kind of like when you make a zine with copy pasting things you cut out of. So I, I use that in a digital sense where I would gather broken images and other formats and kind of collage it together so you end up with things that look kind of like a landscape but it's not it's a corner of a broken video somewhere so that that's kind of how that was made Yeah, uh, it started as a little set of comics I made on post-it notes and I shared it online and people thought they're really hilarious because it's all about like miserable things happening to cute things and they're really happy about it, you know. Mm -hmm. So then I thought I'd turn it into a game where it's like all these random pages and each page is about a different theme that has to do with mental health or, you know, sad things and the consistent theme with all this is that the thing the things surviving the thing are completely helpless and you have to overcome it in a different way like hyper optimism or personal strength and, or whatever because the the idea was that video games are power fantasies where the player is always in charge and in charge of the outcome ultimately like uh, you know, sure, you're up against uh, an evil empire and a massive bad guy, but you have a gun, so it's fine, you know, and you win in the end. Where the opposite, it was really interesting to explore what if you have zero power or zero agency over the outcome of your situation? Where, where's strength in that? So it was, it each kind of explores a theme of personal strength, surrender, hyper optimism, just little stories like that in context of a video game where you, you know, um, experience uh, a power fantasy in a kind of from a different perspective because uh, at the time too a lot of conversations were about like, well, mar marginalized stories or, you know, uh, queer stories and how that exists in video games and how, who, you know, who gets to tell these stories and whose stories are forgotten and all that. So it has a lot of that philosophy from that era kind of bundled into it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a question then. Yeah. Um, so like you talked a lot about how the technology changed and how attitudes from people change towards the technology, but how did your view for the, uh, how did you, uh, your view on games that you're, uh, did your view on the games that you're making change over time since you started in the early 2000s up until today? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. When I started, it, it's hard to express how prevalent it was that websites are the new emergent art form. I, I, linked, I gave a link to that in my writing because flash websites were, I mean, incredible, intricate, detailed experiences with, where people actually hired composers to compose for a website and you had dynamic soundtracks where the soundtrack never repeats and you know you had all these ideas being explored but also very commercial context because the only people willing to check out money for it were uh, brands advertising a product so you had this really big beautiful net art experience about absolute vodka so it, it, it made the whole thing very um, impermanent because none of that is archived or preserved. It barely is. Like there's maybe one book about it, and that's not, it's not even that popular of a book because you know it's from its own little bubble of people. But like it, 
is very largely forgotten. And it, to me, it was always hard to kind of part with that idea that the internet is where art will live and it's uh, permanent. And once you put on the internet, it will live forever. And now we see that it's actually very ephemeral. It's non-permanent and it barely lives over past two years until some change in the technology happens and you have to rebuild the whole thing. So it's kind of like my whole perception of web had to change to be more like uh, you know like sand art where you make really detailed intricate art and sand and then the wind blows it away it's kind of like how your view of online art has had to be and uh, i started focusing more on desktop thinking well there's a solution right you download it it can live forever but then you you have places uh, companies like apple doing this thing where they completely change their architecture and don't support older apps and then your work is lost that way so the idea that digital art has any type of la can last i had to part with and it's kind of like it's uh, now embracing how all of this has a very short lifespan and it's about creating something and sharing it with the world and then letting it disappear It's funny because there, there was a whole conversation like, I don't know, almost 10 years ago about like, let's not use weird, let's use better words for it because we, you know, and then kind of swinging back and forth. Well, weird is a good name, word, right? Weird, weird, you know, but like um, so for me, when there was this whole thing with streamers that picked up everything is going to be okay. And uh, they, all of my work ha had that like a big, a big streamer or, you, you probably know some of them, pick it up, play it, and they'll yell, what the fuck is this? This is so weird. This is like, you know, like, they, you don't really engage with it. You, you play it to mock it. And for a while, that was the only way that games like this got any attention was to go through the mock cycle. And uh, you were kind of expected to be cool with it as a creator because, haha, you just make weird games, you know? But then there was a point where people were really tired of it and wanted this work to be recognized as actual legitimate work that's, ex ha you know, personally expressive. So, yeah, now I think it's like weird is kind of an outdated label for stuff like this where the conversation has kind of grown to be more an understanding why things look different or are a rejection of a classic game, you know. Do you think, uh, so, the, uh, uh, you talk about uh, how uh, that DIY uh, mindset in internet context has like, vanished three years. Um, do, do you think it's also linked to, to like, um, uh, at, at least I, I think that the alternative culture is kind of, um, uh, in the last um, 20 years, uh, as I talked uh, with like alternatives from uh, uh, who worked in 90s, I guess, um, that their mind mindset was much more like uh, what is possible, like in alternative spaces, as, um, I don't know, we have uh, Rogue and Matilda, like, Yeah, that, that mindset is kind of, um, our, our generation uh, lost the, the, the mindset that all of that is possible without, without uh, like, in the environment. Yeah, it's a big uh, shift that happened in tech philosophy or tech culture over the last uh, 20 years where, you know, early internet was all about, um, benevolence towards humanity like if you follow work from people like Tim Berners-Lee it was it was all about information and connecting people to information and science and very utopian and then it, it started to shift to be very tech bro culture where disrupt became good like the, the more you destroy in society the better, more of an edge you have and I think that kind of translated into 
net art or art, uh, the digital art circles too, where you kind of just, you, you, there's this alienation that took place from the original love for technology and it's, it became kind of a pattern of competition. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, when I started, like it was, I came from more classic art and animation. Like I had no coding experience whatsoever, but my, my I really just wanted my art to move and react. And the more you want your art to do stuff, the more you, you go learn how to do something. And it's, it's actually surprisingly doable. You know, it's kind of like you just snowball into becoming more technical. Um, at the time, anything weird online would take off. Like I had the, my site, my pro, the first project was Blue Suburbia, which was this interactive poetry experience built in Flash. And it was kind of like this whole animated, richly animated world where it didn't really make sense. It was very um, surrealist and you kind of float through it and experience poetry in this very interactive animated sense. And uh, that, took off really heavily as like a, they had a small cult following around it where you know people were really into it and making fan art and starting fan pages for it and uh, you know it, eventually it, it, it kind of, it's interesting how it kind of clashed with the game label because at the time video games were very strictly had to be fun and uh, have a purpose and a goal and uh, art like this almost looked like a game but it wasn't and it didn't have a purpose or goal other than reading so it clashed a lot with the gamer crowd you know and then eventually art games started becoming more normal and people started challenging that what games are and the games don't have to be fun and the games don't have to have a purpose you know like walking simulator movement and all that so th that's kind of how I ended up in games but I n until I don't know, a few years ago, I really didn't view myself that much of it as a game designer, the, but game label ended up being the umbrella term that covers a lot of this work. It's hard to tell because every one of them is kind of like special to me in its own way because it, you know, but I think in terms of uh, how it, it being ex expressive, everything is going to be okay is the one that I like showing people the most. And then uh, Tetragon, the desktop version of Tetragon, which is called Armagod because I changed the name to confuse people, I think is an interesting, more gamely type game because it parodies games so well. Yeah, so those two I think I'm most fond of. Okay, then maybe we can end it here. What we'll do now is you guys will have a 20 minute break and then we're going to do the technical stuff. Okay, cool. we'll see you guys at 11. Sorry for the technical hiccups. It worked out. It's